promoting a healthy environment. It's the air we breathe. Clean, safe water. Responsible management of our natural resources. We protect and restore for a sustainable future. Environment matters. It's a beautiful park, and we want this to be a showpiece of it. Plans are underway to restore an area stream to its original configuration by removing a functionally obsolete dam and at the same time improving a popular local fishing resource. Plus, it's important to have watershed groups in West Virginia because our watersheds themselves are so vital. Bringing together watershed protection groups from across West Virginia will check out the 20th edition of the Watershed Celebration Conference and reveal this year's West Virginia Watershed of the Year. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Environment Matters. I'm Jake Glantz. The DEP and the West Virginia Division of Natural Resources are working together on a stream restoration project that's taking a different approach to come up with a permanent solution to an ongoing and very expensive problem. Davis Creek winds its way through the Kanawha State Forest. From its headwaters west of Hernshaw, it descends almost 600 feet over roughly nine and a half miles to its confluence with the Kanawha River at South Charleston. Along the way, it picks up sand and silt. That's what streams do, that is, until it gets here. And then there's a problem. The, the main function of streams is to carry sediment. When you put a dam or other obstruction in the stream, it catches the sediment and holds it back, which in effect starves the downstream reaches of sediment while backing up the sediment in the upstream reaches. So you're eff effectively eliminating stream habitat in doing so, uh, especially in cases like this where it's not for flood control. It's more of a net loss than a net benefit. The pond was formed in the 1930s when the Civilian Conservation Corps built a dam across Davis Creek to create a swimming area. But shortly after it was finished, water quality problems in the creek caused by the discharge from former coal camps upstream meant the pond was never used for swimming. For the past several decades, the pond has been used as a Class Q fishing area, a special regulation area for use by children and folks who use wheelchairs. But a change is coming. The Division of Natural Resources and the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection are working together to reconnect the upper and lower parts of the stream. In the initial phases of construction, what we'll start doing is dewatering the pool, whether it be by pumps or other methods. And then we'll take a notch out of the dam so that the water free flows through. Um, we will have to excavate the sediment, the silt, and everything that's behind it and control that so that we're not creating a, a muddy mess downstream. And as that dries out and we get that material out, we will rebuild the stream channel through, through this entire impoundment, reconnect it with the upstream reaches and the downstream reaches so that it's a functional stream again. Although the dam is roughly 12 feet high, the impoundment behind it is shallow, meaning there's between eight and 10 feet of muck covering the original cut stone bottom. Opening the stream back up will bring a major change and drastic improvement to the pond's ecosystem. You will have a, a stream ecosystem here rather than, rather than a, a still water pond uh, that creates a different type of fishery. Uh, typically in ponds you see you know, bass and bluegill. Uh, the, the stream ecosystem is gonna support more of a trout fishery. Crews will use a technique called natural stream channel design to recreate what this section of Davis Creek would have looked like and functioned like before the dam was built. Design work and securing the necessary permits is expected to take about a year with actual construction to take another 12 to 18 months, depending on the weather. We want it to look like the stream channel has always been there. Uh, we don't want it to look like a man-made uh, trapezoidal channel as they call it or just a, a residential ditch that goes through and there's nothing living in it. We want to put meanders, we want to put habitat structures, uh, whether they be log structures, rock structures. Uh, they use a lot of different techniques 
and we want it to look as natural as we can. I mean, we are in a state forest and we want to maintain that natural look. Uh, we will plant riparian areas along both sides of the stream so that we maintain shade and cover for the fish and aquatic life. But we also want to leave it open enough that the visitors to the park can have access to fishing. Um, it is a fished resource and we want to maintain that. We just want to improve it. And a big part of that improvement will be the work that happens just upstream of the pond area. The impoundment itself is, is going to create about 1,200 linear feet of stream channel. Uh, then we're going to enhance an additional 4,000 or so linear feet above, above the impoundment uh, that should also allow for, for fisheries uh, to be utilized up there. Uh, so so the, the fishery is going to be expanded from, from this small pool area uh, upstream for quite a ways. You know, really, they're going to end up with, with two or three times the amount of fishable area that, that they currently have uh, with the habitat enhancement work that's going to take place. Stabilizing the banks upstream will also help reduce erosion and decrease the sediment load, especially during heavy rain events. This is not a flood control dam. Uh, it can't provide flood control when the fact that it's filled up with sediment. There really is no storage for water uh, in this dam. So whatever comes downstream goes over the top of it and, and continues downstream. The dam does have historical significance, which adds additional considerations to the project's design. We do look at that and we take that into account. Uh, we will work closely with the State Historic Preservation Office uh, to make sure that, that this site's preserved uh, as much as possible and, and the history is preserved. Uh, even though the dam, you know, the majority of the dam is probably going to have to be torn out, uh, you know, we will, we, there will be mitigating factors that, that we will take into account and, and make sure that the history is preserved and, and the information's here for, for everyone who visits the park to, to know what was here and what stood here at one point in time and, and why it was constructed. Funding for removing the dam, clearing the sediments, and reconnecting the stream comes from the DEP's In Lieu Fee Program. Program manager Scott Settle explains how it works. The West Virginia Inlu Fee Program is is funded uh, through impacts by various industries. Um, it is a mitigation option when an industry has an impact to uh, to either a state water or a water of the U.S. Uh, they have to mitigate that impact. One of the mitigation options is to is to pay into the Inlu Fee Program. Uh, we take that money. And, and we conduct stream and wetland projects throughout the state uh, to help mitigate some of, those, some of those losses to aquatic resources and, and aquatic function. The other part of the funding comes from an innovative idea to turn a recurring problem into a permanent solution. We have also had an additional funding come through where several years ago, the West Virginia DEP and their mining and reclamation section conditioned a nearby mining permit. Uh, they conditioned that permit that it would be issued on the condition that they would come in and dredge this pond for, to not only control the sediment, but to make it more accessible to fishermen, uh, make it a better aquatic resource. The mine operator started to dredge the pond last fall to try and improve the fishing area, but because of a wetter than normal season, frequent rainstorms would fill the pond back in with sediment as fast as it could be dredged out. After several months, the work was stopped to wait for the weather to improve. In the meantime, the DEP and DNR reevaluated the project and came up with a better plan. The DEP, the DNR, and the coal company got together and we have come to an agreement where instead of dredging the pond, they are going to help uh, give us money to further enhance the stream. Um, that way we can do things for this project that we can't do under the Inlu fee program. We can enhance the uh, fishing re access. We can put in uh, paths or uh, fishing platforms, whatever we need to do, the Inlu fee can't cover. Uh, and we may even be able to extend the bank stabilization further upstream with that money. And it is earmarked for the park to do uh, projects that will be beneficial to the park and mainly the stream. Um, so that, that's a win-win for us, uh, in our opinion, because 
we can do more good rather than excavating sediment out of an impoundment that will fill in again in just a couple of years. The impoundment would have to be continually, uh, continually dredged out. The, the maintenance would, like I said, would, would have to be on a regular, you know, three to five year uh, cycle. Uh, and it's expensive. It's expensive, to, it's expensive to dredge it out. It's expensive to, to move it, to truck it, to place it. Uh, this, this is a permanent solution. Once the work is finished, the DEP will monitor the channel for the next seven years to make sure the changes to the stream structure continue to work as designed. After that, the agency will provide long-term stewardship money for someone to continue monitoring the project. So it's not something that's, that's one and done and, and we leave. It's, uh, it's something that we make sure that's in place and is in place for you know, not just the environment, but the residents that utilize the, the Canal State Forest for, for a long time. And it's an example of two different state agencies coming together to develop a better solution than either could have come up with on its own. DNR and DEP are working together on this project in a number of ways. We're not only working with the DEP's NLU fee program, we're also working with the folks out of the Mining and Reclamation Division. Uh, we're working with not only state parks, but also wildlife resources. So it's, it's a huge cooperation between us all to make sure we get the best product, the best work done on the ground, and get the end result is a better use inside the park for the, the visitors, for those who come to Canal State Forest. Um, it's, it's a well-used park, it's a beautiful park, and we want this to be a showpiece of it. Uh, it will not only be a showpiece, but also an educational tool. Uh, these uh, reconstructed stream channels are fantastic aquatic resources. Um, they promote better aquatic diversity. Uh, they have more landforms or habitat types. Uh, it's, it's, they're really amazing to watch them work. Nearly two dozen volunteer watershed protection groups recently gathered in Lansing, West Virginia for the 20th anniversary of Watershed Celebration Day. This year's Watershed of the Year was awarded to Friends of the Cheat. This honor comes with a $5,000 grant. Watershed Celebration Day is a way for groups from across West Virginia to share success stories, learn from each other, and to brainstorm solutions to common watershed threats. And to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the event, Environment Matters executive producer Mike Huff and Tommy Bergstrom from the DEP's Watershed Improvement Branch produced the short documentary, Home Waters, presented here. Our watersheds themselves are so vital. Um, they're vital to our communities, they're vital to our state, to our economy, and really to our lives. And I think the watershed organizations really are the direct line of communication for our local communities. Uh, we work very hard to let people know the importance of pr protecting the watershed and how everything is related. It's vitally important to engage the community. The um, communities are who live around that body of water, so they know what's going into that body of water once you educate them and, tell, and try to, to get them to pay attention. Uh, because most people don't really think about what goes in the stream. It goes down the stream and it, it leaves, but there's things coming in from upstream. And once you start to look at streams and you understand that that's what's right in your backyard, in some cases it's also what we drink, the community has to become the advocate for their stream. Oh, that, that's most important. Getting a buy-in is most important because those are the folks that we need to, to engage and do the work on, those that are closest to the stream. That, that helps to do the buffer, especially like the riparian buffers. And, uh, and then like say, outreach to the folks along the tributaries because it all flows down, downstream and, and so it's not it's not just the main branch, it's not just the main location, it's the entire watershed and its, its tributaries. So the watershed groups in West Virginia to me represent an opportunity for, for different groups, different user groups to connect. So you have 
Uh, you have folks that are concerned about their drinking water. You have folks that are concerned about flooding. You have folks that are concerned about the environment. Um, it's a good opportunity for, for all those folks to, to come in under one umbrella, leverage funds to, to help on all their causes. Um, it all also provides uh, educational opportunities for the community, um, allows you to uh, look at different uh, opportunities for uh, local projects to better the community, um, reaching out, getting funds from outside the community to help your own community. Each community has to take responsibility for their stream. Otherwise, your stream's not going to get cleaned up because the people who are advocating for their stream are going to be the ones who get the funding and work to, do, to get the monitoring and the mitigation going on. But most people know what's going on in their stream. What are some of the, the things that are threatening their stream, such as sewage, uh, acid mine drainage, other things that can impact the stream, erosion, that sort of thing. And so the community knows what's going on, or the better source of what's going on in their stream, and then they have to become active in, in championing their stream for cleanup. The people who work for watershed organizations and maintain them um, are very dedicated, they're very passionate, and they're very hardworking. Uh, the flip side of that is that the work can be exhausting, it can be demanding, and um, staying motivated can be difficult at times. For me, um, at times when I feel exhausted or I start to feel burnout, uh, all I have to do is walk out my front door, I walk down to the river, and I see the beauty that needs to be protected. I, I can see the importance um, because I'm living here. Uh, so, so really for me, staying motivated is all about um, living here and, and just seeing the beauty day to day. And, and I have two young children and I want to keep it healthy uh, for them uh, in the future so that they can enjoy it the same way that we do. Our biggest challenge is keeping people motivated. We, uh, we get people dropping into the group every once in a while and, and they drop out. We've got a core group of people that are very motivated, uh, come to all the meetings and are really productive members of, of the Watershed Association. Um, our biggest challenge is getting people back to the meetings. They see we're having success and they feel that maybe their, their presence or their, uh, they aren't needed uh, to help us out. And, and really that's not the case. We would love to have more and more people come to these meetings. We really think we could expand our, our umbrella to, to uh, a number of more important issues than, than we're already doing. I'd say the toughest part in keeping the Watershed Association going is I don't know, keeping the excitement, uh, keeping the existing members uh, engaged, and recruitment. There's always uh, the opportunities with schools, uh, but it's difficult. Somebody has to go out and reach out to the teachers uh, to try to find the students and, and get them involved. Uh, so that is probably the best way, is, is through the, the young kid groups, schools, scouts, churches. Uh, so that's, that's always been a, I don't know, a big part of our cleanups and I think that's just really good for them to to be part of cleaning this watershed, the streams up and that be able to see what they've done and then uh, just see the improvements of the streams over the years. It's always good. Uh, to date we have removed more than 2300 tires from the landscape and almost 300 tons of trash which is you know, to me, it's pretty exciting in our 23 years that we've been able to accomplish that. With a, you know, our biggest cleanup was maybe 40 people, and sometimes we've had as little as 12 or 15. But the fact that the community keeps coming together to make it better feels pretty good to me. Long story short, um, uh, here we are today, several years later. But this is one of the one of the few streams in southern West Virginia that supports three species of trout. We have brown, rainbow, and brook in the stream, and it's do, they're doing quite well. Uh, we've uh, cleaned up over 100 tons of solid waste over the years, uh, and each year that gets less and less. So we, we're certainly making a making a dent in that, and changing the way that the community looks at the environment. I don't know that trout could have survived in it when we first started. But you, see, you saw a few bass and a few minnows were starting, and over the past 10 or 12 years, it's, it's a healthy stream. 
feels good. Uh, a lot of hard work, but people ask me why you do it. If you wait on somebody else to do something, chances are it's not going to get done. So don't wait. If you got an idea, you want to make it happen, make it happen. Patience, persistence, and thinking outside of the box. Um, we don't have endless resources, so we have to use the ones we have wisely and partner and work together, and that's how we've come this far, is cooperation and collaboration, um, and big props to you know the folks that had that vision in the beginning to let us carry it through. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of positive things happening now. Now we need the other part of it. We need the revival. We need the tourism back. We need uh, the people to come here and stay and spend money and go rafting, go fishing, camp at the campgrounds and kind of, you know, see it as, a, as what it is, the natural beauty here. Um, my ideas and my passion are much bigger than my funding and the time that I have to give. But it's those positive passion projects that, that keep, keep us motivated. I love West Virginia with all my heart and, and um, it can be disheartening to see how it's underappreciated and taken advantage of. So my, my hope is that the people who live here and, and love the state continue to work together to, to protect it. We keep, um, that we keep coming together and that we don't give up and we keep protecting it um, for you know, the next hundred years. Fall means college campuses across the state welcomed new classes of incoming freshmen, but at one West Virginia school there was more to it than moving in, meeting new roommates, and questioning the wisdom of scheduling an 8 a.m. class after a whole summer of sleeping in. The DEP's Brianna Hickman joins us now with the details. Jake, Adventure West Virginia is an optional outdoor orientation program at West Virginia University that offers first-year trips to incoming students to help introduce them to the state, to college life, and teach leadership and teamwork. First-year trips feature outdoor adventures like backpacking, rock climbing, and whitewater rafting, and also a community service component. And that's where we caught up with one group of newly minted mountaineers. This is not your typical freshman orientation. Maneuvering a wheelbarrow loaded to the brim with gravel down a muddy trail deep in the woods of Preston County. Today's project involves working with the watershed group Friends of the Cheat to restore a section of the Allegheny Trail, the state's longest hiking trail running almost 300 miles from Brewston Mills to the Virginia border. This is the third day that we've had him out here and we're gonna finish today. We're almost done, we've done a lot of good work put a lot of gravel, over 15 tons of gravel, moved a lot of rocks, a lot of trees, and it's gonna be a much more enjoyable trail. We're gonna get rid of the muck and the wetness, and you're gonna be able to walk down to Decision Beach or even further down to Big Nasty Rapid and kind of enjoy the Cheat Canyon uh, via trail. So uh, yeah, it's a good project for the community, and we get to use strong, young, uh, eager students. That was ambitious. <laughs> Push it. Students like incoming freshman Cole Kaler. There we are. It's pretty fun, honestly. Uh, as you can tell by my face. <laughs> but yeah, I like it. It's a great experience. I actually, it actually makes me feel good, honestly. I feel like I'm making a difference <laughs> for the animals and whatever else is, whatever else is back here. <laughs> the trips last five or six days and involve between 10 and 30 students. They're led by upperclassmen student leaders. You know, we're just out here to help. We really love Friends of Cheat. We love what they do for the state. And I mean, the whole thing is about getting freshmen out into nature and showing them all of the opportunities that they can do outside of campus in West Virginia. The students are wrapping up work on this half mile section that runs through the Cheat Canyon Wildlife Management Area. Organizers hope that they will continue to return to enjoy the fruits of their labor. We're doing you know, some serious work. We're getting uh, you know, people out here in the younger community to engage and build the trail, which hopefully they come back and, you know, they go to the Cheat Fest or they come to this area, they go boat, but they also take the time to walk in here and appreciate 
you know, the, the snail habitat, which the Nature Conservancy worked hard on to preserve, and also the DNR. You know, this is a place people can come hunt and, you know, just recreate. And I think people, you need to, you know, use this resource. You know, it's new, maybe unheard of. People are a little timid about the whitewater, but they can still come here and hike and enjoy the scenery. And enjoying the scenery has its benefits, too. Uh, I think it's an amazing project. Um, trail work is really, really important. You know, it, I feel like getting people outside really helps people calm down, feel centered, um, especially from the stresses of college life. The trips cost less than $100 and are free for Pell Grant eligible students. To find out more, visit their website, adventurewv.wvu.edu. For Environment Matters, I'm Brianna Hickman. Thank you, Brianna. We leave you now at Sandstone Falls on the New River. On behalf of all of us here at the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, thank you for watching. More than 800 people with one mission, promoting a healthy environment. We are the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection.